the Doc and Eric Jubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets Wrap. Well, Eric, as you predicted, uh, really over the last couple of weeks, gold and silver were taken down midweek. This week, gold was taken back below 1,200. Silver was taken back to a 16 handle. But really, the second half of the week, the last couple of days here, Thursday and Friday, has been a bit promising. Gold held at uh, the 1180 level. Silver uh, refused to break down really much further than it, and it didn't even quite touch 1650. Um, it's really been holding really around the 1665 level. And as we record here late in the Globex session on Friday, both gold and silver are trading above the levels and have been throughout the day of uh, the previous 24 hours uh, charts. Gold actually has been trading above 1190 most of the day. Silver has been trading right around 1170, give or take a dime, for most of the day. So all things considered, it hasn't been that bad for a cartel attack. No, it, it, it hasn't. It actually shows that they have great difficulty making their case be heard when they push the prices down because the buyers are here, they're buying the dip. That was most easily seen in the chart yesterday. I mean, uh, we had uh, uh, San Francisco Fed governor out talking about you know, the interest rate normalization and all the other job owning they typically do as a dog and pony show to, um, to try to set expectations for the mess that they've created in the credit markets, but it also serves a double purpose of uh, beating down gold. And the timing speaks to that because, uh, you know, we're going through first notice day now. And the dip down in gold and silver was, you know, sharp, quick, and then the bounce back super fast, which goes to show the buying of the dips. And uh, today versus yesterday's trade, you know, it was so, let's see, about, about 10 o'clock or 9.30 or so in the markets uh, in New York time uh, that we saw the dip yesterday. And today we see, you know, at the exact same corresponding time, the peak of where silver traded, for example. Um, and then today uh, as well, every time silver would touch the same time and uh, corresponding price of the 24-hour period previous, it bounced off of those uh, peak prices. So that actually, if you look at a Kitco chart um, for a 72-hour period, and of course this is kind of like a manufactured spot, it's not a real spot, but suffice it to say, it does reflect what's going on in the near-month contract on the COMEX, and you can see the footsteps, uh, the footprints, excuse me, of the of, uh, uh, hedge fund accumulation um, algorithm trading in the, the trading and how it bounces off of yesterday's price print. So the paper boys are still here is the point. Uh, they're still accumulating, and you know, with them we also have the uh, Asian buyers uh, and the Middle East buyers still accumulating very strongly. And like I was talking about uh, two shows ago, um, you know, we have this window that we just transversed through, this time period we just transversed through where the uh, comics in particular, but LBMA also playing the same game of near end of month uh, closure of the near term contract. And this week, you know, that's what played out. We saw gold and silver being taken down. Uh, the, the cartel did not want gold to be over $1,200, lest that create a lot of uh, profitable long positions where. You know, they basically be rewarding, rewarding the paper traders. They want to smash those and have those contracts expire worthless. And the similar situation with silver uh, above seventeen dollars. That was a no-no. So the cartel attack. And going into next week, I think we're going to have a, span, a fantastic June. I mean, I, I think that there's a very strong case to be made that this um, was probably the last buying of the dip opportunity to grab silver easily in volume and. Uh, Seventeen dollars and less. I mean, right now trading about just under, well, roughly about sixteen dollars and sixty-eight cents or so on spot for silver. And uh, you know, it's, be, I, I doubt we're ever going to see below sixteen-dollar handle uh, and on silver. And likewise, <clears throat> two weeks ago when we were talking about this pending possible crash, not crash, but you know, cartel capping. Um, you know, any prices below twelve. 25 gold and silver below 16 at this point is, is probably not in the cards. The physical supply is so tight. Silver is going to be in a deficit throughout the remainder of this year. I mean, even mainstream um, cartel participants like HSBC are calling for a silver deficit in 2015 on a physical basis. So I, I, I think the cards are 
um, completely different now. We have a completely different setup. The, um, you know, the bull market did reboot back in November, and even though we've seen a huge amount of capping and a huge amount of volatility, those lows still held, and I think the bull market is alive and well. It's just been kind of like a stealth bull market so far, but as we move through June, the price is going to go a lot higher. Let's also touch here on really the current big hot issue, and that's Greece. What's your thoughts on Greece, Eric? Does Greece have the potential to throw a wrench in uh, the plans for your outlook uh, for gold and silver, or is uh, the Greek situation not likely to be as critical as a lot are warning about on the Internet with uh, in the likelihood of a, a Greek default next weekend that basically the entire derivative markets um, detonate and the entire Western uh, financial system goes into meltdown? Yeah. Well, no matter what happens, the situation is probably going to be a positive for gold and silver. Uh, I don't subscribe to the uh, very stark view that Greece is going to default and create a, you know, a cascade based on just a default of 300 plus million euro that are due on June 5th. Uh, there's a lot of indications that the ECB, if push comes to shove, and they have to back off, that they will back off. And I'll unpack that because there are a few different um, variations on the theme that can unfold uh, following June 5th. For starters, we had a leak from the IMF uh, that was carried in, I think, uh, British news outlet Channel 4, if memory serves. It was about two weeks ago. And they uh, uh, openly spoke about the probability of a Greek default that the IMF uh, considered it to be putting good money after bad to try to support Greece uh, if, in fact, Greece was not willing to agree to the IMF's perception, and I underline that, um, of what Greece agreed to do when it came to austerity programs and the uh, curtailment of pension programs and um, the Greek public sector and, and a lot of various other planks that came from their uh, long negotiation in terms of trying to buy uh, time and get the IMF and the ECB to continue to basically do this debtor financing program that's been going on in Greece where you know, Greece, is, Greece is insolvent, first and foremost, but they basically have this debtor financing game going on that buys them time by borrowing more money to pay the interest on the money they already own. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, if a consumer... An individual had a credit card debt, and they just moved their credit card debt balance to another credit card because they got a, a new offer in the mail, and that's kind of what's going on with uh, the Torica. But in the grand scheme of things, in June, Greece has 1.5 million euros that are due, and, and that is not actually a heck of a lot of money. I mean, it sounds like a lot of money to the perspe perception of someone like myself or you or an <laughs> average listener or what have you, but to put it into perspective, you know, the... Uh, ECB's launched a QE program that's in excess of a trillion euros, and it wasn't all that long ago the Federal Reserve was dumping $85 billion into the market on a monthly basis in the QE program most recently. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, to put up uh, 30, or excuse me, um, 300 million euros uh, on June 5th, or to even let it go by the wayside and formally declare Greece in default, but in reality do nothing thereafter, and in fact maybe even along the lines of the Cyprus scenario, declare that the derivative positions associated with that $300 million are just basically not qualified to um, be considered as a formal default triggering the requirement for the credit default swaps to pay off in a derivative scenario. Therefore, nuking the nuclear potential of the derivatives domino crash. And that is, in fact, what happened in Cyprus, if, if our listeners will recall. So in the grand scheme of things, I don't think that the ECB, the trico overall, is going to uh, let 300 million euros, a pandily sum, take down over $120 billion worth of direct ECB exposure to Greece. One way or another, they're going to figure out a way to kick this can down the road. Along those lines as well, I saw in the last couple of weeks reports from various uh, circles within the German establishment that uh, a lot of people within the political establishment in Germany have been basically lobbying uh, Merkel to uh, figure out a way to back off and to let Greece default, but to basically, along the scenario I just described, do nothing about it. <laughs> that 
play a game for three months pretending that the default doesn't really matter because it's a small euro amount uh, in terms of dollar, in terms of money magnitude, and you know, pre- extend and pretend to use that tired phrase that was coined by I think uh, John Wilson Raff over at Wall Street Journal. So that's where we stand. Um, there is a huge amount of hyperbole uh, out on the internet. I'll even name a name. Uh, the the Louis Bruch, uh pack group right now is talking about how this June default is ultimately going to lead to World War III nuclear war. I mean, um, people are getting pretty worked up over this kind of stuff. And frankly, I think that the ability for the powers that be to contain uh, any kind of derivative risk for the June 5th deadline in particular is not going to be too hard for them, considering how small the euro value we're talking about. Um, the scenario of a default crash spinning out of control is still here. I think that it could happen. It probably could be uh, a reasonable probability even later this year. Um, but for this particular incident, incident um, you know, the euro value is not monumental. They'll, they'll figure out a way to deal with it. So you think it could be perhaps something like what we saw in 2007 where Bear Stearns goes down in March and takes really six or seven months to work its way through the system as far as all yeah. the counterparty ramifications. Yeah, that's a great analogy. And even if it is uh, only uh, putting pressure on the system and making uh, counterparties more nervous rather than the direct connection of one counterparty linking to other counterparties creating a direct domino change uh, in the marketplace, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily going to spin out of the June 5th default if Greece is, in fact, to default. I mean, just today they were even saying, without nominating exactly where the money would come from, that, oh, yeah, we're going to make the payment. We'll be fine. We're going to figure out how to you know, cough up this 300 million euro payment on June 5th. So uh, the Bear Stearns analogy is apropos because very often a lot of these scenarios take time to filter through. I mean, another great example, too, is the uh, derivative exposure that the shale oil industry has had over the last uh, you know, boom period from 2009 going all the way through to the bust in the fourth quarter of 2014. You'll recall that even myself and people like David Morgan and so forth were thinking that you know, back in December when we were talking about this, December, January, that starting basically now, we'd see the window where this bad debt would uh, begin to have a big impact on the marketplace. And as it turns out, you know, we're wrong. It's not, it's not having a big impact on the marketplace. Uh, two weeks ago, three, three weeks ago, sorry, my memory fades, but uh, when we had uh, 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 Rick Rule on the call and he was talking about the same basic translation mechanism of this bad debt creating to the washout in the uh, oil sector industry and with the benefit of you know, further uh, data over the course of an additional five months' time, under his belt, he was talking about the December, January time frame where the oil sector will bottom out and where those junk bonds will have a big impact on the, the marketplace. And, and uh, listeners will recall that I asked him point blank whether he thought that there'd be a counterparty derivatives problem growing out of this 200 some odd uh, billion dollar pile of debt that was used to finance the shale industry. And I should also back up a step too because there's been a lot of confusion from. Even people like Jim Rickards talking about, you know, the debt that's associated with the oil sector, and he was kicking around six, seven trillion dollars worth of debt, uh, but not really accurately or sufficiently defining where that debt would uh, be coming from. I mean, the, in terms of the sector that was the hardest hit, we're talking shale oil plays, and that segment of the overall oil industry certainly did not have six trillion dollars worth of debt behind it. It was more like two hundred trillion. So anyway, with that in context, it's just as a footnote, uh, it, the bottom line is that it takes time for these kind of things to translate through the market. And it's not like this is a black swan. I mean, come on, everybody can see that, you know, everyone and their dog in the alternative and asset investment community has been talking about these things in Greece for e- over a year. So, you know, the market has had this information flowing through it, and that puts on dampers to the shock value of specific events as they come down the pike. It's not that. You know, I'm making the argument that the majority of the financial community is uh, completely aware of this risk of these risks and pricing them in. No, no, no. I'm not making that argument. I'm simply saying that, in terms of black swan 
uh, catalytic impact potential, this June 5th trigger with a piddly 300 billion euros, excuse me, 300 million euros, is just way overstated. It's not going to take down the whole financial system. All right, well, transitioning back to the metals a bit here, um, the big news in the physical market this week really was released today by the U.S. Mint as they announced that uh, effective this coming Monday, June 1st, the U.S. Mint is going to be ending their allocation of the Silver Eagle coins um, for the authorized purchasers. Um, in the statement from the Mint, and I'll uh, read it here, we're pleased to announce that effective Monday, June 1st, we will no longer be allocating American Eagle silver bullion coins. Authorized purchasers may purchase as many American Silver Eagle bullion coins as they desire. Um, and you can kind of see this coming um, with uh, the Mint's sales statistics for the month of May. They've only sold about just over 2 million coins in May after um, about 5.5 million in January, 3 million in February, 3.5 million in March, and just under 3 million in April. So about the last four weeks, the Mint has... At least to me, it looks like the Mint has been able to catch up on production a bit. Um, but overall, if you look at the numbers, for 2015 through, let's just call it the first five months of the year, Silver Eagle sales are right around 17 million ounces, which project that over a full year, it's right around 41 million ounces, which is just about exactly the, um, the record years of the last couple of years. So... Um, the mint has continued running at capacity, um, but it's it's good news for um, physical buyers that allocation and they've been allocating for I don't know if you remember when they first started allocating but this last time, Eric. It seems like it's been about six to eight months. It started uh, off the top of my head now. I'm forgetting if it had started before the big physical run last October, November, but it's at least been since then. So it's been at least seven or eight months. Price-wise, you probably won't see much of any difference at SD Bullion. We've been selling Eagles pretty much at cost of 225 for the last several months. But across the industry as a whole, for customers buying coins elsewhere, premiums will likely creep down a little bit here as the rationing has ended. So the authorized purchasers are able to purchase um, as many as demand requires, and that trickles down through the market and um, has a direct effect on premiums. Now, when you say that they're no longer going to be allocating, are you speaking of 2015 Silver Eagle only? And, and I assume that that's what you mean. And then right, well, the U.S. Mean? the U.S. Mint just uh, sells the current year coins. Yeah, it's been six to eight months that they've been allocating, meaning that the uh, the authorized purchasers of the world that not anybody can buy the bullion right. coins from the U.S. Mint. They have to be a uh, authorized purchaser. There's the U.S. Mint has really, really, really strict requirements for authorized purchasers, and all of the retail dealers then uh, have to buy the coins from an authorized purchaser, and then the retail dealers then uh, distribute them to the public, whether that be a local coin shop on the corner or a big Internet business. They buy the coins from the, the authorized dealers. So when uh, their purchases from the Mint are allocated, those authorized purchasers hike up their premiums because they might only be able to purchase maybe 100,000 coins a week, and they've got dealers calling that would buy six or 700,000. So just like any market, uh, if you've got a limited supply and demand outpaces that, you, you can raise your price to uh, meet the demand to uh, clear those coins that, that you are allocated at the highest possible price. But uh, So when the, the U.S. Mint then... Uh, removes their allocation and the authorized purchasers are able to purchase as many as they want, it has a natural effect of lowering premiums because if if uh, the dealer I've been purchasing from, if he still wants to charge a higher premium, somebody else is going to lower them because they can buy as many as they want from the mint. So just nat natural competition, just like any free market, uh, drives the price down. By memory, uh, I don't recall the mint making this kind of a move this early in the year. Uh, with the exception of the 2009 period of memory serves. Um, what do you think that, that, in terms of market signal intelligence value, tells us that they're going to do this in June? Well, it's actually pretty unprecedented that they have allocated production for this long. In times past, they've only allocated production for four or six weeks. Um, 
and I mean they have stop production or stop sales in extreme cases um, for several weeks while they um, catch up on uh, while they catch up on production to uh, meet demand. With the big takedown back in 2013 being probably the most recent time they temporarily stopped produ stopped well they didn't stop production they stopped sales while they um, continued producing and um, before that in 2011 with the big smash. Um, but it's been pretty unprecedented over the last, uh, the really the bull market investment coins started in about 2007, 2008 with the big ramp up in demand for Silver Eagles. It it hasn't really happened before that to go this long of an extended period with continued allocation to the purchasers. So it's been unusual that it's gone on this long. Typically it's been maybe a January, February thing and and then outside of the big price takedown where there's a huge demand surge, the dealers can always purchase what they want. So, I mean, overall it speaks to the level, sustained level of physical demand that the market's seen over the past six to seven months. And again, even though May's numbers are only just a bit over 2 million ounces, for the year we're right about 17 million ounces and on pace for projected 41 million ounces in sales, which is, again, right at the mint's capacity of all they've been able to produce and sell over the past couple of years, per year. Very interesting. Well, we'll, we'll see what happens when that scenario meshes up with increased uh, consumer demand, because if we get over 1850 in silver, sending uh, the technical signal to all of the technical trader people in the Western world, where you know the majority of people who buy paper in that market, definitely pay attention to technical analysis, even though the stacker may mock the technical analysis perspective. It'll still move prices. Uh, I just frankly think we're going to even cross 1850 in June uh, just because of the return of momentum into the marketplace. And this whole paper smashing game has gotten to the point where you know, the cartel, in their managed retreat, quote unquote, have had to back up. Uh, and we are now looking at uh, higher highs on excuse me, higher lows after their takedowns uh, since the November period. And that pattern remains. We talked about that a couple of weeks back uh, when we were talking about the probability of the cartel stepping in here and making a mess of the place, and here they've made a mess, and we're already starting to see the market firm up. Uh, you know, after the takedown in midweek, uh, we basically went sideways, and that's exactly what one would expect to see. And uh, we're already through the you know, couple of days of the 10-day or so trading day period that's typically needed to heal the market and let it begin to move forward again. So uh, that data point with what's going on at the Mint uh, fits in with that scenario that I've been describing as well, too. All right. Well, uh, I think we'll wrap up this week's show there. So we'll certainly keep an eye on the market next week, especially uh, how everything plays out with Greece as the the deadline of June 5th looms and grows closer, and we'll see uh, who backs down or uh, the fallout and scenarios if we do have a, a confirmed default in a week's time. So hopefully Eric will be right, and we won't have a, an instantaneous uh, derivative meltdown because is we, we won't be here to do a show if we have a nuclear war on June 7th. So you know, <laughs> right? But we'll know soon enough. All right, so we'll uh, we'll keep our eyes on the markets, and we'll hope Eric's right for next week. But for this week's show, thanks for tuning in to the SD Weekly Metals and Markets. <laughs>